and allow me to share once again. Oops, there we go. And with that, I would once again uh, like to welcome everyone to the Los Angeles Birders webinar for tonight. We do have Lance Benner presenting on Red Cross bills. But before we get there, I would like to ask you, if you're not a lab member, please consider and please uh, consider joining the lab. Uh, Los Angeles Brothers, we only require $20 per year and your support helps to helps keep these live webinars happening. We record our webinars and maintain them on our website for future viewing. We also have a local field ornithology, I'm moving this, field ornithology and community science projects going on. And um, all of this uh, takes money, not a lot of money, but some money. And uh, we appreciate any support we get. So thank you very much. And with that, I uh, there we go. With that, I would like to introduce once again Kimball Garrett, who will introduce, introduce this speaker for tonight. Kimball. Okay, well, it's time for me to gush again, but this time it's about the speaker. Um, we're very pleased tonight to have Dr. Lance Benner with us again for another presentation tonight. Uh, as many of you know, Lance is a planetary scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he specializes in radar imaging of near-Earth asteroids. Um, in other words, he's responsible for saving our planet from collisions with asteroids, so give him a big uh, round of applause for that. Um, Lance has made a, a number of significant contributions to the birding world and to lab as the chair of our science and research committee. He spearheaded many of our community science research projects, and for years he's coordinated our efforts for America's birdiest county. And of course, to us, Lance is always the go-to person for owls and crossbills and and many other things. Lance has been recording bird sounds since 2009. He's made many significant contributions to audio databases such as Xenocanto and the Macaulay Library through eBird. His recordings have been used in various research projects, books, educational nature programs, smartphone apps, and development of sound recognition software. So we're very, very pleased to have Lance with us tonight as he describes Red Cross Bill biology the 11 or 12 or whatever the county is now, North American call types and their geographical distribution. So please welcome Dr. Lance Banner. Well, thank you very much, Kimball. That was very kind of you. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and get started here. So let's see, now loading up my PowerPoint. Are you, are you seeing it? Yes, yeah. that's great. Yes. Okay. okay, let me move that little thing out of my way. And um, so let's, uh, let's get going. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, describe a number of things about Red Cross bills. And uh, if we have enough time, I'm also hoping to, to delve into um, some information about evening grosbeaks, which uh, is another finch species that, uh, that has um, different flight call types. So here's a quick outline of what we're gonna do. We're gonna start with the crossbills. I'll go through a brief introduction, say a few things about their distinguishing characteristics, their biology, their geographic distributions, why their beaks are crossed, what, you know, what uh, advantage that can provide them. And then we're gonna go in at some depth into the different flight call types. And I'm going to um, show you examples and, and play videos with recordings of the different flight call types um, and yeah, to follow up on what Kimball just said, there are 11 in North America now that have been accepted, and there is a paper in preparation by Matt Young and Tim Sparr documenting flight call type number 12, which is the common one in the northeastern part of the U.S. and eastern Canada. Um, and then we'll go through pretty much the same kind of approach with evening grow speaks, all, although I'm not going to spend as much time on them. So um, let's see. Um, hmm. Ah, there we go. So in the bigger picture, why do we care about Red Cross bill flight call types? So from time to time, people ask me this question and they think perhaps we're just interested in splitting species and augmenting our life lists. Um, well, no, it's actually a lot more important than that. I mean, we're really trying to understand 
the geographic distributions and the you know the biology of these different populations. It certainly does have ramifications as for whether or not these are species. And in fact, uh, as we'll talk about later, one of them here in North America has been split, um, as has at least one or perhaps two, depending on whose book you look at in Europe. Um, it's really um, how, how the red crossbills are adapting to different conifer conifer seeds and their geographic distributions and how they move around and the way that their vocalizations develop is one of the more interesting kind of puzzles in uh, in you know bird evolution in North America at the moment. So it's it's really a very fascinating subject that uh, once I started learning about this a little over a decade ago, learning in details, like I just got really hooked on it, and uh, it's it's been a lot of fun to study it. So, um, but without any further ado, I, I, before I move on to some of the more technical details, I do want to point out that there has been um, a modest bit of movement by red crossbills in the southwestern U.S., especially Canada and also in no, Canada, California. And I'm also showing Southern uh, Nevada in this map. So this is an eBird map um, from uh, just a couple of nights ago um, um, from this calendar year, 2022. And the uh, the, the uh, blue markers are eBird records that are more than a month old and the red ones are more recently uh, than that within the last month. And so the main point is that there has been um, some, some movement of red crossbills um, out of some of the places where they're normally found. Um, for example, um, you know, T Telegraph Mountain and Death Valley National Park, some of the lowlands out in the East Mojave around the Las Vegas area, including the uh, Mount Charleston area. Um, they've been turning up down around Mount Laguna and San Diego. Um, there have been some records around Mount Pinos and, and, uh, and Pine Mountain um, in Ventura and Southern Kern counties, places where they can occur but aren't always present, as well as, of course, the San Bernardino, San Gabriels, and so forth. Um, so there does appear to be a modest eruption underway right now. So be on the watch for these. They're, uh, they're, they're moving around, and there have been some reports in the lowlands. Um, so I want to give you an example of, of what they sound like. And um, so throughout the talk, I'm going to be using a number of, uh, of audio spectrograms, also known as sonograms. Um, this is an example of one that I created using a free software called Audacity that you can download. And I use the um, on on a Macintosh, Macintosh the quick uh, QuickTime player to do a basically a video grab um, of a scrolling sonogram. So the green line, vertical green line here, will indicate the sound that is playing at any given instant. And this this is going to scroll um, as the uh, as the recording goes. So let's let's begin here. These are going to be Type Two uh, Red Crossbills. Um, recorded about five years ago on Pine Mountain in Ventura County. Uh, so this is just north of Ojai. Get the clicker. A little bit of song. This was a flock of about 30 birds that was approaching me. Those are little song fragments. Probably a creeper. So you're seeing a number of different vocalizations. Here. Um, so here we're coming into some particularly loud vocalizations. So most of the sounds that are present in this recording are what are known as flight calls. Um, red crossbills are well known for making flight calls. It's by no means the only vocalization they make. They do make them while they fly, and they also make them when they're perched. Um, in this case, they were flying when the recording started. Um, by the end of the recording, a bit longer. This one was and so the volume had stopped changing because the birds were on a tree about 50 yards from me. Um, you heard that? So, so here's an example um, from the Sibley Guide to Birds of what uh, adult red crossbills look like. Um, this is a female, of course, on the top and a male on the bottom. So this is a, you know, sort of a, a medium to small sized finch. They are larger than a goldfinch, smaller than say a pine grosbeak. Um, the females are generally kind of dull yellow. They have some very dark brown on their wings. The males have almost dark brown, almost black on their wings, um, some on their back, um, bright, well, yeah, fairly conspicuous red. And of course the distinct massive beak with the tips that are crossed, um, hence the name crossbill. 
Um, they primarily eat uh, seeds from different kinds of conifers, although they will also take bugs and, and uh, other things from time to time. Um, so this is another illustration uh, from David Sibley. And uh, on here on the left is a young red crossbow. So this was, it would be a hatchier bird. Um, and they, they can look like this for a number of weeks. And then as they age, they will gradually develop some color, typically some yellow. And then as, if they're males, they will start to develop flecks of red that will become progressively more red. If they're females, they will become more yellow. So when they're about a year old, uh, for example, this is a male here uh, on the right, this is what they, uh, they will look like. Um, so here are some photos of some young crossbills. In this case, uh, they were here in Los Angeles County at Apollo Park in the Antelope Valley. Um, so the one on the left has uh, already has some pretty obvious red on it. So that one's a male. The one on the on the excuse me, the one on the left has some red. The one on the right is uh, it's not completely clear yet whether that's a male or a female because they could have extensive yellow before developing the red. Um, in this particular case, um, a number of us got recordings. Uh, while the birds were there, and they turned out to be uh, flight call type three. Um, in fact, there's pretty good evidence they were breeding recently, although it's not completely clear that it was at that particular site, because they, even when they're young, they can, can fly considerable distances. Um, here's another young bird. This is a male. Um, so again, you can see, and obviously this is a specimen, um, uh, that has flecks of yellow and red on it, plus vestiges of the, of the streaks. Um, this particular individual apparently hit a large picture glass window on the, the warming hut on Mount Waterman, which is where I found it um, in 2011 when I was mountain biking in the vicinity. And it, it's now in the collection at the uh, LA County Natural History Museum. Um, so red crossbills um, have a, a wide distribution um, in, in the Northern Hemisphere. They aren't, they, they aren't known to occur in the Southern Hemisphere, <laughs> at least not yet. Um, so this is a, a very recent map from eBird that I, uh, that I uploaded just a few days ago. So there, as you can see, they're clearly widespread in uh, North America, um, North America, including Mexico, which is of course also part of North America, um, in, into Central America, widespread in Western Europe, um, and farther east uh, into Asia, Japan, even into um, the Northern part of Luzon and the Philippines, uh, some mountains in Southern, um, Southern Vietnam, kind of Northwest of, uh, of Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon. Um, there are also, of course, a lot of red crossbills throughout Siberia, but very few birders or very few e-birders go there. And so there's a humongous gap in our knowledge there. There's also a large gap in uh, parts of Mexico where they undoubtedly are a lot more common than we can, than we can see from this particular map. But you, know, you can see they occur through, you know, around a good portion of the Mediterranean, including some of the forests and montane habitat in uh, North Africa, the islands in Mediterranean and widespread in Turkey. Um, in the Himalayas, Nepal, and, and so forth. So um, red, red crossbill flight call types, they're, well, they're different subspecies, but there are also a number of different flight call types. So, and I forgot to update this. Uh, for North America, this says 11, at least 11 flight call types. Well, apparently now it's at least 12. Um, and each one of them is adapted for a specific conifer species, although they will readily feed on others if fruit is available. Some of these not only maybe separate species, but uh, the American Ornithological Society has begun to split them with type nine being split into the Cassia crossbill a few years ago. Um, there are also crossbills in Europe, of course, over there, at least uh, in the British literature, they're known as the common crossbill. Um, and they're considered to be the same, pretty much the same species. Um, although whether that's the really are the same is, uh, is is something that I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about in the near future, because there's a lot of genetic work going on. And there are subspecies uh, in a number of different places, including a number of islands in the Mediterranean. Um, there's also a system of flight call types being used in Europe. Actually, there's more than one system of flight call types being used in Europe. Um, some of them use letters, others use north and south, and then numbers, and I'm not really going to go into that. Um, that's not really the, the focus here. We're going to mostly concentrate on North American crossbills. Of course, their closest relatives are the white wing crossbill, um, white wing crossbill here in North America, known as the two barred crossbill in Europe, Europe and Asia. Um, and also, of course, the Hispaniolan crossbill, which was split from the white wing crossbill um, relatively recently. Um, and to answer a question that I received pretty, re pretty frequently, um, red and white wing crossbills are not really known to hybridize very much. Um, um, I'm sure that happens occasionally, but I, I haven't really seen anything in, in literature about that. 
Um, so here is a range map from the uh, of, Nor of North American Red Cross bills uh, north of Central America um, from the uh, National Geographic uh, Field Guide, uh, seventh edition uh, by John Dunn and Jonathan Aldifer. Aldifer. And um, the purple area shows year round locations uh, and the the dashed lines are an attempt to up, up in the north and in the south to show the kind of the limits of where they occasionally um, erupt, where they have large movements. Um, and I, I chose to show this range map because, uh, quite frankly, of the ones that are in books, this is the one that has the most accurate maps. Um, certainly more accurate than the uh, the one that appears in the Birds of the Birds of the World uh, um, series, which has things kind of out of whack in several places. Um, but even though it shows them in, in some places, apparently, you know, like here in Northern Baja or in Southern California appearing year round, it doesn't mean they're always there. Um, it's not uncommon, for example, for there to be a lot of Red Cross bills in the San Gabriel Mountains in some years, but none for a couple of years after that. And, and then they come back and they typically come back when there's a, you know, there's food available and then food often, in, at least in the San Gabriels means um, a lot of cones in the Jeffrey Pines and the Ponderosa Pines. Uh, and to a lesser extent in the uh, lodgepole pines. Um, the populations do move around and some of them really are probably best described as nomadic. Um, so why do they have crossed beaks? Well, so this is um, you know, an adaptation that has evolved that uh, provides them with um, an evolutionary advantage. It, um, basically, so this is an illustration here on the left that shows how the birds can use their crossed beak, in this case, a white wing crossbill, as a lever. And uh, down here on the, the lower part of this figure, this line drawing, it shows a crossbill opening its beak. And in the process of doing that, it pries open the uh, the ends of a pine cone, uh, which is quite often where they feed. And the fact that the beak not only is crossed, but that it's curved, the, the curvature is actually quite important because that, that, um, that helps to dissipate the stress associated with using the beak as a lever. If a bird with a straight beak attempted to do this, say, a pine siskin, the tip of the beak might snap off. But the fact that it's curved here actually um, helps them use the, the beak as a lever. And then they can poke their tongue in there and get the seed out. Um, and here's an example of a crossbill on the right, of a crossbill attempting to do that on a lodgepole pine cone up, um, up in the, um, um, the Big Bear Lake area in the, uh, the San Bernardino Mountains. Um, and here's a closer view. In this case, this is a, um, a red crossbill. Um, a male, uh, perhaps not a full adult yet, because it still has a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of splotchy gray on it, uh, doing this in one of the Aleppo Pines at Pear Blossom Park in the Antelope Valley, um, which last I checked actually had a decent number of, uh, of ripe pine cones. Um, once they extract the seed from the cone, they still have to kind of husk it. And so here's a female, in this case at Table Mountain several years ago, near, near, the, um, near the big um, you know, disc golf course up there. Uh, this is the Eastern San Gabriel Mountains of Los Angeles County. And what they do is they use their tongue to roll the seed against a structure on the um, lower side of their of their upper mandible. And that flakes off the outer shell, and then they can go ahead and eat the seed. Um, and there is, in fact, some evidence that these, these different structures on the palate of the bird vary with the different flake call types. Um, although this, from what I, what I knew last time I checked in the literature, is something that needs, to, needs more uh, research. But... Uh, it may well be possible to identify some of the flight call types in museum specimens based on measurements of the pallet structures. Um, they don't limit what they eat just to, to mature seeds. Um, here's a picture of, uh, of a crossbill, uh, admittedly not a really sharp picture, but uh, in the lower left, um, eating on the staminate cones um, of, in this case, I believe this is a Jeffrey Pine at Buckhorn Campground in the San Gabriels. In the upper left, there was one that was uh, apparently po uh, poking along at insects on the branches of an incense cedar. Um, so they, they don't limit themselves just to mature cones. Um, so the beaks cross in both directions. There's no particular um, pattern regarding which direction they cross. That is males and females, they cross both ways. All the different flight call types, as far as we know, they all cross both ways. They don't have a preferred left or right crossing. Uh, likewise with the white wing cross bills. Um, so the thing I mentioned about the pallet structures, I've already talked about that. Um, so they have this, this very 
very interesting adaptation. And in addition, the beaks vary enormously in size, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. Another interesting thing is that the they have um, asymmetric muscle structures um, associated with the uh, the crossover of their beak. Um, that so it it actually they're 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 somewhat more they're somewhat stronger on one side than the other. Um, which enables them to again use their beak as a lever. It's a very interesting adaptation. So the beak size is very enormously, and uh, so here is an example um, again from uh, from one of David Sibley's uh, illustrations, showing a type three, which is uh, the smallest one. Uh, this this is a species that feeds on small soft cones, primarily in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, type six, which is known to occur um, in southeastern Arizona, then all the way down into um, into Chiapas and Oaxaca in southern Mexico, primarily feeding on, on um, much harder cones, uh, at least in Arizona, for example, things like Apache pines. Um, so um, as I mentioned, there are a number of flight call types. Now this is a, an idealized illustration that shows most of them, but not all of them, from a paper by Ken Irwin that was published uh, in 2010. Um, so Ken did a lot of fundamental work on, on uh, crossbills, um, here in Northern California, and uh, um, but rather sadly, he uh, he passed away earlier this year. But he did this kind of epic, epic work, um, particularly on a flight called Type Tens. And his his monograph on on red crossbills has a large number of examples of many different recordings. But he has a particularly nice illustration in there that shows some of the most common flight call types for each of the ones that are shown here. So you may notice the types nine eight and nine are missing, and then 11 and 12 are, are missing as well. At the time we did this work, types 11 and 12 weren't recognized yet. Um, type eight was, uh, but it, it has a limited geographic range. And at the time, type nine was also thought to have a very limited range. Now, each one of these different types can look different from this. This is These are meant to be some of the more common um, ways that these flight calls can appear in an audio spectrogram, in a sonogram. Here's an illustration by um, by Jeff Groth from his monograph in 1993, based on his uh, his extensive work in the late 80s and into the early to mid 90s. It's a lot more complicated than the previous slide illustrates. There are in fact a lot of different variations. So what this shows on the left column is the flight call type and here he goes up to number eight because that's all that was known in the mid 90s when he did this. And then there are some variations next to it. And um, the way that these different calls can appear in an audio spectrogram or a sonogram also depends on things like how loud the sound was. If it's really soft, you may not be able to see all these features and how you stretch out the sonogram vertically and horizontally. Um, it can look quite different if you stretch it out a lot or if you compress it a lot. So there's a time scale here at the bottom and uh, it's worth keeping that in mind. Generally, if you want to be able to see the structure of the red crossbow flight calls in a sonogram, you need to zoom in quite a bit. Um, if you don't, they will be very compressed in time and quite it'll be quite difficult to discern their shapes. Um, so there's some interesting things about these red crossbow flight calls. They're, so the different flight call types, and you know there are now 11 that are well established and a 12 that's in the process of being written up for the literature. Um, there are multiple variations for each one. The calls themselves are not innate. They aren't hardwired, they're learned. The birds learn them from other individuals, apparently in their flight call types. They associate primarily with their own flight call types and they are mostly genetically isolated. They interbreed very little with other flight call types, even in places where the birds overlap. For example, the type nine crossbill, which is also now known as the Cassia crossbill in Southern Idaho, overlaps the range with type fives and type twos. They all occur in the same part of Southern Idaho and they all breed there, but they don't interbreed very much. They in fact interbreed less than a number of other species that are well known or at least well established to be separate species. They can also breed throughout the year depending on the availability of food in the cone crops. So if they are moving around as they often do and they stumble into a large area or an area with a lot of food in the cones that hasn't been eaten by other things yet, they will nest at any time of the year. They they could start nesting now if there are you know if there's a movement and they stumble into a, a ripe cone crop. More typically, they nest in the late winter to early spring, but it could occur at any time of the year depending on food. So, for right, example, right now in the San Gabriel Mountains, there's a there are a decent number of uh, of ripe Ponderosa and Jeffrey pine cones. 
Um, there have been some reports in the area, and it wouldn't surprise me if we do see them nesting this coming winter and early spring. So among the different flight call types, they each type has a primary association with certain species of conifers. They aren't limited to these, but these are the ones that they associate with most frequently, at least as has been revealed by field studies by various people like Jeff Groth and Craig Bankman and his students and um, a number of other researchers and a number of community scientists like people attending this talk. In fact, this whole talk is a good example of, of how you can contribute to community science by recording red crossbills and entering your sightings in eBird. So for example, the type the type twos that are the ones that are most common in the Southern California mountains are primarily adapted for ponderosa pines. Um, and we do have a lot of those in the mountains locally, but they will also readily eat Jeffrey pines, which are even more widespread, at least in the San Gabriels and in the Sierra Nevada, uh, at least at higher altitudes. Um, type ones are more adapted for uh, Eastern white pine and red spruce. Uh, that's primarily in central and Southern Appalachians or Appalachians if you're from the South, um, you know, and so forth. Um, type threes primarily for soft Western hemlock cones, Engelmann spruce, type four, another one that uh, is adapted for soft cones and Douglas firs. Um, not the big cone Douglas fir, which is almost endemic to Southern California. Um, there in fact are no crossbills that are known to feed on those. But type fours readily feed on regular Douglas firs that uh, occur, for example, in the Pacific Northwest and um, parts of Arizona, Colorado, and so forth, Sierra Nevada. Uh, type five specializes in lodgepole pines. Um, type six uh, mentioned hard cone pines, as, such as Apache pine. Um, type seven, not very well known. Um, some of those definitely feed on um, lodgepole pines. Um, I personally have seen them doing it in uh, northern Canada in in Yukon, southern Yukon. Um, that, those aren't studied very well. There's a lot a lot we don't understand about those. Um, type eights are limited to, in their range to Newfoundland and um, Newfoundland, and uh, they primarily feed on black spruce. Uh, type nine, a specific lodgepole pine subspecies is endemic to the South Hills of Idaho, uh, although it's more complicated, and I'll get to that, and so forth. Um, type eleven, yellow pine in southern Mexico, and um, you know, Chiapas, Oaxaca, that area, and then into like Guatemala, um, Honduras. And uh, type 12 is the new one. And um, they're actually, in fact, the most widespread type in, in the Northeast. And uh, the, the conifers they uh, feed on primarily are Eastern white pines, but also various spruce, balsam, fir, Eastern cedars, um, and, uh, and tamaracks. So here's a, to kind of highlight this, this is another illustration showing something quite similar where you have the the different cones um, and the different crossbills and their beaks, where, for example, this one here, um, which would be a type two with a large beak and a ponderosa pine, which is quite a large and, and, and hard cone. Um, whereas, say, a type three over here in the lower right, um, it feeds on hemlock, which is a much softer and smaller cone. Um, so, Having said that, um, what I'd like to do next is to go through some examples of the different uh, crossbill flight calls. So uh, for each one of them, I'm going to show um, a map from eBird. Um, and these are these are recent maps. In fact, for some of them, I'm going to show the most recent map from just a few days ago. We can compare it with some older ones so you can see how observations from other eBirders, like those of you who are attending the talk, um, have been contributing to our knowledge and um, and how we've learned more about where these birds are distributed. So this is uh, where the type ones have been located. They're primarily concentrated along the Appalachians in the east, but they've been found widely all the way across the continent, including all the way up into Southern Alaska. Um, this over here on the upper right is a, an example of a sonogram uh, from, the, uh, uh, from an article that appeared in eBird a number of years ago. And here on the bottom is a this is going to be another scrolling sonogram from, from the Cornell Master Set uh, prepared by Matt Young at the Cornell Lab a number of years ago um, of a type one red crossbill recorded in New York. So of course there were some other birds in there too, including uh, an Eastern uh, white-breasted nuthatch. Um, so that was a type one. So, um, 
play that again in a minute to advance to the next slide. Okay, so this is uh, this is type two. So I have two maps here to show you just how many have been reported um, by eBirders across North America between 2014 when the when I started giving this talk um, versus now. Um, again, this was an eBird map prepared uh, just a few days ago, showing how many more places they have been reported. So type twos are a flight call type that's, as I mentioned earlier, primarily adapted for ponderosa pine, which is a Western pine, but they are, are known to widely um, range widely. In fact, they've been recorded all over the Northeast into the mid parts of the Midwest, even in the Great Plains and in the Pacific Northwest as well. Um, so here's a, a fairly typical example, again, from the Cornell master set. In this case, it was recorded in Oregon. This is a very loud, emphatic call. Okay, let's stop that. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, this is the flight call type that is most common in Southern California. And this is the only flight call type that has been re reported and recorded and documented in the mountains um, south of the Southern Sierra Nevada. There have been some other flight call type threes, but they've all been in lowlands or on the, the deserts not in the mountains. Um, oops, no, 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 let me uh, hold on. Sorry. Okay, let's try this again. So here's one of my recordings. This is in the San Bernardino Mountains in 2013. Um, so it sounds a little different. There was also a cowbird there. It sounds a little bit different from what we were uh, hearing in the previous recording, there's enormous variability in the in the, um, in the flight call types of type twos, and uh, we've heard several different flight call variants in this part of the state in the last decade. Um, it it happens a lot. Um, so, type three is another one that has also occurred in this part of the state. They're primarily adapted for soft conifers in the northwest. Um, the range map in 2014 shows them concentrated up there with quite a few records in the Northeast, but now they, um, they've extended much farther, much more extensively up along the coast from British Columbia up into Alaska, and there are even more records in the East. Um, they range widely. I mean, I personally have heard these in Plum Island, Massachusetts, um, and also up in Yukon, um, as well as in Tacoma. They, they range widely. So here's an example of uh, of what they sound like. Again, this is from the Cornell Master Set, and this is one that was recorded in, in not Ithaca, but in New York. So that's the type of flight call for type threes that has been heard most frequently among the birds that have been documented in Southern California. There's one other type three flight call variant that I've heard here, but only, only a couple of times. When we, when we get type threes in Southern California, this is usually what they sound like. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so this is type four. Um, type fours have been recorded in California, although not as extensively as the others, type twos and type threes, they have not been recorded in Los Angeles or other Southern California counties yet. Um, again, you can see an eBird where they've been found, primarily concentrated in the Pacific Northwest. Again, this is a bird that's adapted for soft cone species like hemlocks and, and so forth. Um, not really a, a bird that's best adapted for, for harder conifers like ponderosa pines. Um, although I'm sure they could, you know, could actually eat those. There have been some records in California near, for example, Monterey. There, um, there's a record from um, just north of Yosemite National Park in the central Sierra Nevada. Um, there's a number of records in southern Arizona, um, but so far there are no records in southern California. So this is one that could, in fact, occur down here at some point. So here's what they sound like. Again, this is one variant. This is probably the most common variant. Um, if you were to go birding in a hemlock forest, western hemlock forest, and say the Seattle area, it's a really good chance you would hear some of these. They're quite common up there. Uh, so are the type threes, by the way. Maybe I'll figure out how to avoid doing that. Okay, so now let's go on to flight call type five. Primarily a western bird. Again, they're adapted mostly for lodgepole pines. They're widespread in the central and northern Rockies. There are also some farther west. They've been recorded um, in limited numbers in, um, 
in the Sierra Nevada, and there are some records in the Bay Area. There are no records uh, in this part of the state yet. There certainly are, you know, lodgepole pines in Southern California. There are a lot of them in the San Bernardinos and the San Gabriel Mountains, for example. But um, there are no records of this flight call type yet. Right now, there are a modest number of them roaming around in San Mateo, Santa Cruz, um, San Francisco counties, Marin County in the Bay Area. So if you happen to be up there and you hear crossbills, um, please record them. And uh, there's a pretty good chance that right now they'll be type fives. Um, and so here's what the sonogram looks like. It's um, two sounds that are sort of sub-parallel, almost parallel. And in fact, you can tell that there are sounds that occur um, on this part and then on this other part of the of the, uh, the flight call that are happening simultaneously. So this is a bird that is um, using both sides of its syrinx to vocalize. And uh, here's what it sounds like, a uh, flight call type five. So there was another little variant in there. Okay, moving on to, okay, not moving on yet. All right, now we'll try moving on. Okay, type six, this is the one that I mentioned. Uh, it was first documented in Southeastern Arizona, but they're now known to occur all the way down into Central America, e even east of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec down into uh, Chiapas and, uh, and Guatemala. Um, so if you're on a birding trip in the mountains down in this area, you might find these. And you know, a few years ago, a group of us uh, we're down in, in the mountains of Oaxaca, and we heard some of these, some flight call type sixes. Um, but you can also find them in Southern Arizona. There are um, reports in the literature that there's a specimen at the San Diego Natural History Museum of flight call type six. Um, not quite sure how that's known because I don't think there are any recordings associated with it. But um, there are no records of any that have been recorded, any live birds in California, at least not yet. It's not out of the question, but there haven't, it hasn't happened yet. So the, the flight call type for those is kind of like a, a broad V or U shape. Um, and if you were to spend time in, say, the Catalina Mountains, the Huachucas, you know, the Pinaleño Mountains, the Chiricahuas, um, there's a pretty good chance you could hear these. It's not the only type that's there, though. There, there are also types two, three, four, and five that can occur in the same area. Um, so here's an example of what a type six sounds like. All right, now we come to type seven. Very little is known about these. They're, they're often referred to as the enigmatic type seven uh, red crossbill. Um, the, I believe the type specimens were recorded in Southern British Columbia by Jeff Groth in the, the late eighties. Um, it's not shown in Eber, but it would be someplace in the region in the realm of kind of Kamloops, Kelowna, that, that sort of area. Um, not that far off the, the Trans-Canada Highway, for example. Um, and west of the uh, of the Rockies, of uh, the Canadian Rockies. There are a small number of other records. Uh, there's one here from Northern British Columbia, another one here on Vancouver Island. Um, there are some of my own that, uh, yes, I need to enter that are from the Whitehorse area. Um, we've recorded them up there as well. Um, you can see some more recent ones in a few other scattered locations. Um, there's not much known about these. Um, they, they apparently do feed on, on lodgepole pines, but um, there's really just not a lot known about them. Now, a lot of these, if you just hear them in the field, may be pretty challenging to identify without a lot of practice. Um, so my recommendation is record them. Um, you don't need fancy equipment to get good recordings. You can, you can do some very good work if you use your cell phone. And there are a lot of eBird records that have documented different flight call types using cell phones. So give it a try. You have nothing to lose but a few bits in your phone if it doesn't work. Um, okay, we'll get this eventually. Okay, so type eight has a very limited geographic range. This has been found, it's been recorded and, and entered into eBird only in uh, Newfoundland. Um, it's not the only crossbill that occurs there, um, and its numbers apparently are not that large. There's some concern actually that this is a flight call type that might go extinct. 
Um, they're having a hard time because there's competition from introduced squirrels that are eating the same food in the black spruce that this, this particular type favors. They may also occur, I think there's evidence, although it's not shown here in Ebert, that they occur on Anticosti Island in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, just off uh, the northeastern side of the Gaspé Peninsula of Quebec. Um, so here's what they sound like. And again, that Newfoundland or maybe Anticosti is the only place you're going to be able to find these as far as we currently know. Well, there was kind of like a siskin there. Okay. Okay. And now we come to type nine. So type nine is also known as the Cassia crossbill. So the American Ornithological Society split this several years ago um, based on a number of things. Um, it's genetic isolation, the difference in the vocalizations, the fact that at the time that those observations that the work was done to leading to the split, they were known to occur only in two small mountain ranges in Southern Idaho, the, uh, the South Hills and the Albion Hills. Um, where they specialized in eating a particular subspecies of lodgepole pine that is known to occur only there. And it's also a region where there are no squirrels that also eat the lodgepole pines. And so the, the principal predator of those cones is in fact the crossbill that occurs there. So the, the trees in the crossbills have been kind of co-evolving for apparently in the realm of 15 to 20,000 years. Um, there are other crossbills there, though, as I mentioned, type twos and fives occur there and also breed there. So if you go there looking for this and you find crossbills, you can't assume that it's a cashier crossbill without recording it, because there are other ones that could be there. This has, in fact, been a recurring problem in eBird. The limited range was one of the arguments, although by no means the main one, for splitting this as a species. Um, and the reason it gets interesting is that in 2021, um, they were found in parts of Colorado. And there are numerous reports now in 2022. And a number of recordists, such as Nathan Peeplo, have been looking at their data, their older recordings, and finding that they have actually been there for over a decade. At least their recordings indicate that they have. Now, whether these are just birds that are moving around or if there's really an established and resident population making these same flight calls that's hundreds of miles away from Southern Idaho. It's not entirely clear, but they've definitely been there for at least the last two breeding seasons, um, which is very interesting. It'd be very interesting to see how this kind of, excuse me, plays out. Currently are still classified as a separate species. Um, and also both still classified, both populations here as Cassia crossbills. Um, so here's what they sound like. That was another example from the uh, the Cornell master set of recordings. That again. Okay, type 10 is the one that was discovered by, by uh, Ken Irwin in the Pacific Northwest, in the vicinity of Northern California, Oregon, and Washington, um, as part of his work a number of years ago. Well, uh, when eBird, actively started splitting or separating the different flight call types based on recordings, there were a large number that were reported in the Northeast too, which was rather puzzling because they're thought to be adapted to Sitka spruce, which doesn't occur in the Northeast. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, Matt Young and Tim Sparr are preparing um, a paper that's going to um, basically suggest and provide evidence that in fact, these are different flight call types. And the ones in the East are a new one that uh, they're labeling type 12. Um, there are a small number of type 10 records in the Northeast, um, so Tim tells me. We actually exchanged a message about this uh, earlier today. But there also are definitely type 10s in the, in the West and up into Alaska. So here's a recording uh, from Rob Fowler from Humboldt County uh, from two years ago. This is, this is, in fact, a type 10 recorded up in uh, Humboldt. Now there's my bird button. Hope that doesn't distract. Okay, so we'll say a little bit more about type twelves uh, in a moment. Um, 
some of those are now becoming visible in, in eBird as an option. Um, the, the the paper describing them hasn't been written yet, but uh, it's 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 coming soon. Okay, as lovely as it is to hear the especially the thrushes. Let's go on to type eleven. So this is the one in Central America. Um, it's their their range is also still being studied. Um, so when uh, when we were down um, in a trip with Oaxaca, this was uh, Kathy Ellsworth and I joined uh, um, Desi Seaberth, uh, his parents, and John Sterling with uh, Eric Antonio Martinez uh, down there a little under four years ago for a week to go birding. Um, we documented some type elevens in the mountains uh, just a little bit north of Oaxaca City, um, and so there are um, a few records in that area, and they're also been documented on the other side of the isthmus in Guatemala and even in Honduras and Belize. Um, so then some of the sounds we recorded while we were there, we, we actually don't know what they are. They may well be type 11s or they might be something else. We, we found some things that didn't match any previous records. So here's a look 11. So that was from uh, Francesca Albini, Albini, who um, is one of the eBird moderators in that part of Mexico. So if you go down there and find something rare, you'll probably hear from Francesca. Um, so a little bit about type 12. So here's an example of what a sonogram looks like. Um, there are a modest number of records that have been accepted as 12s in eBird so far. Uh, there'll be a lot more. The ones that are labeled as type 10s are going to migrate into 12s probably in the near future. Um, here's a recording that I got um, in Franklin County, Maine, about two months ago. So that, that's in the Rangeley Lakes area of, uh, of Western Maine. Um, as I mentioned, some of the crossbills that we recorded in, in uh, Oaxaca, we don't know what they are. They, here are some examples. They don't match any of the known variants of the flight call types. Maybe they're type 11s, maybe they're variants of type six, or maybe they're an, an, another type that hasn't been identified yet. Uh, we need more data. Uh, be a great, great topic for a master's thesis to go down there and, and uh, study this. It really hasn't been investigated yet. Um, in addition, there are some variations on the uh, on the on the eastern type tens, which are now being labeled type twelves. Um, I'm not going to play a recording of this, but this is an example of how one how they can look. Looks quite a bit different from the one I showed you before. Um, this was recorded about five years ago at the Bangor City Forest in Maine. Um, they also, of course, sing. Uh, so here's a song. Songs are very different from flight calls, and then they also have excitement calls. So this is uh, not going to have a scrolling sonogram, but you'll you'll hear what it sounds like. This is part of their their song. In this case, from a Type Two. And we hear songs very similar to this in St. Gabriel Mountains. If, if you were up at that um, in Grassy Hollow in January of 2020, there were lots of crossbills there, and they were making songs like this. To make matters more complicated, they also incorporate flight calls in their songs. And some of the flight calls that they sing are flight calls from other types. So it gets messy. Um, so here's an example of some of the birds that were up at, uh, at Grassy Hollow. So we've got a different kinds of things. There are flight calls over here on the right. So that the top figure is a, a screen grab of part of what I'm going to play for you. So these are some flight calls. And these other things here are known as toop calls or excitement. They call toops because they sort of go toop, 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 toop. And there are ways you can use the tube calls to identify the different types in addition to the flight calls. It gets complicated. So here's what all this sounds like. There are going to be tube calls and flight calls and other species on top of it. And in fact, there might even be an evening grow speak in here. Um, we'll find out because there were some vocalizing that day. Let's see, where's my cursor? There we go. Bluebirds, Western bluebirds. Light calls, light calls, more flight calls. And this this last thing here that didn't play, that was an evening gross speed. Uh, we'll hear that in a little bit. Okay. So there are a number of species that can sound similar. Um, we don't have time to play recordings of them, but um, House finches can sound surprisingly similar. Pygmy nuthatches fool a lot of Eastern birders who come out here. They think they're hearing crossbills, but they're actually little pip, 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 pips from the nuthatches. All the sided flycatchers, they can sound similar. Now, I'm not talking about the quick three beers call. I'm talking about the pip, pip, 
pip, pip, pip calls from off-sided flycatchers. Cassin's finches can also make calls that are similar, and so can common red poles. Um, yes, we don't have to worry about red poles very much, unfortunately, here in California, but elsewhere in the country, it's, it's actually pretty easy to mix those up with crossbills too. So this is a flake call type two. Try to pause this for a sec. So this was the first one that we got that identified this flight call type in Southern California. This was in 2011. Uh, Walter Zaliga and John Garrett and I went up there. And then the week after that, uh, Kathy Ellsworth and I went back and got recordings. It's the first time. We, we know that there were crossbills in Southern California for many decades, but we didn't know which flight call type they were. And so we went up there and, and discovered, hey, they were type twos. And I've been recording them ever since. Um, we've also got type threes but not in the mountains. These, these occur in the desert, um, deserts and also on the coastal slope. Here's a recording from Pear Blossom Park from about 10 years ago. And see how much softer they sound from the type twos. Let's play that again. There were some guys playing basketball as well. And here's an example of two different types in the same place. This was in Horseshoe Meadows, which is due west of, uh, of Lone Pine in Inyo County. Um, the reason I'm showing this is because this is the southernmost record in California of type five. And I, on the top figure, I've labeled type fives and type twos um, at Horseshoe Meadows, about 10,500 feet in an area with foxtail pine and lodgepole pine. Since type fives are adapted for lodgepoles, they might occur farther south, but so far this is the farthest south that anybody's found them and documented them with recordings. If you're in lodgepole pines and you hear a crossbill, you cannot assume that it's a type five crossbill could be something else like a type two, as this recording illustrates. Oops. Five, two, five, two. One, two, two, couple five. You know, I think you get the idea. So, I hope I've conveyed to you that there are still a lot of aspects, many aspects of their taxonomy that aren't well understood. We're still learning about the different flight call types. The geographic distributions haven't been fully mapped yet. They move around a lot, sometimes over enormous distances of hundreds of miles. We need recordings. You can help. Please record them. If you ever find them, please record them. Okay, so I've been going on for 50 minutes at this point. Um, I did want to say a few things about evening grosbeaks. Um, so we'll speak maybe for another 10 minutes or so, and then we'll stop. Um, and I see there have been some questions too, so we'll we'll uh, we'll get to those. So let's move on to some evening grosbeaks. There's been a, a push of evening grosbeaks in the Southwest recently as well, uh, particularly in parts of Arizona in the vicinity of well the mountains north of Flagstaff. There've been some farther southeast, around Las Vegas, the Owens Valley, Death Valley, a few here and there in the Sierra Nevada southern in the Southern Sierra Nevada, that is, and a couple in the area near Salinas and Monterey. So be on the watch for these two. They, they have been on the move. We, we haven't seen any reports in Southern California recently, but it could happen. So there are five flight call types of evening gross peaks as well, uh, identified in the paper by Kendra Sewell. Um, you can hear them if you become familiar with them, if you practice, they're quite distinct in sonograms. And the flight call types correlate with different, different geographic distributions, but unlike the crossbills, they aren't known, known as far as I'm aware to really correlate with different tree species. Um, although Kimball or John Dunn, if you're there and you know otherwise, feel free to chime in. Um, so here is a figure showing what they look like. Um, there are variations of each one of them, but the variations are more subtle than they are for the red crossbills. The different, the five different types that are known so far generally look like this. Um, they do, however, sound different, and um, we'll, we'll play examples so you'll be able to hear this. Um, so, of course, this is what an evening grosbeak looks like: male on the right, female on the left. You know, it's a bird with a massive beak. They're very loud. They often move around in very large flocks, occasionally in smaller groups, but often in large flocks. Um, they eat a variety of things. They eat up various types of seeds. Uh, they're well known to frequent bird feeders with seed on them, but they also eat a lot of uh, a lot of bugs. In particular, at least for those of us who are from the Northeast, as I am, they're well known to eat spruce budworms, which are small caterpillars um, that in, episodically infest the forests of the northeastern part of the country. 
very loud birds. They don't really have a song, but they do, they trill and they make flight calls. Um, they, as I said, they had a massive beak. They eat all kinds of different seeds from various, various trees and, and buds. Uh, there was a big ex eastward, eastward range expansion early in the 20th century, uh, perhaps due to planting of box elders. They were primarily a sort of Western species before that. They are known to um, erupt. And in fact, there's a big up uh, eruption going on in the Northeast right now. They were really common in the Northeast from the 50s into the 80s. Uh, I can remember growing up in New England, seeing large flocks of them. Sometimes there'd be thousands of them just all over the place, and then they'd be gone. But uh, then they declined precipitously. Now they're, they're in the rebound. Um, so this is the geographic distribution of the five types. The ones that occur in California, the ones that breed in the Sierra Nevada are, are primarily type twos, although far enough north, there's also some type ones. Um, type four is more in the southern and central Rockies, type fives down into uh, the, the uh, Sierra Madre, um, uh, western Sierra Madre. Um, so I guess that would be the Sierra Madre Occidental in, in Mexico, and then type threes in the Northeast. And between the Northeast and Western Canada, there, there, there are a lot of them there, but they haven't really been recorded yet, and we don't really know what they are. There are also some in Southern Mexico, and those aren't really studied either. So um, we really could use recordings there. They would really help. Um, so let's uh, have a, a listen to some of these. So these are some examples of um, uh, type ones. This is a recording that I got in central, actually, yeah, central British Columbia near the northern edge of where they're known to occur, at least based on eBird. This was from uh, 2019. So the trills aren't diagnostic as a type, it's a call vibe. So this thing here, that's a call. This curved thing with the vertical lines on it, that's a trill. And they all trill, but the calls are different. Um, here's an example. Uh, in this case, it's from uh, Lake Tahoe, showing both type two and type one. So that's the type two, type one, two, one, uh, two, no, one, sorry, one, two, two, and so forth. So twos are the ones that, that nest in that area in the Sierra Nevada. You can hear that they sound different. Um, type threes. So this is the this is a current range map and they're erupting in the Northeast right now. This is a map from just a couple of nights ago and the red ones are all recent. So these are type threes. This was recorded uh, at the University of Maine in Orono um, two years ago. And then there were those other calls there. There was a trill here. These, these other calls here were um, a red, uh, common red pole. Type fours are the ones in the central Rockies. A series of calls and trills and other little sounds. This is from Lake and Deeplo. So they make a variety of other little sounds. These, these lower pitch little whoop, whoop sounds. Uh, that's a, sorry, that's a poor imitation. Um, I'm not sure how to classify that. It's not really a song, but it's it's um and it's not indicative of the flight call types as far as I've heard. Um, and this is a uh, type five. This is a really nice recording by Rich Hoyer in the Huachuca Mountains. Um, oops, I spelled that wrong. Um, from Southern Arizona. Uh, they're also known to occur down into um, Southern Mexico, Puebla, and uh, at least one of the states that's adjacent to it. Very poorly understood. Here, a um, oops, there was also a, a trogan in there. Um, so these are some uh, evening grosbeak records uh, recordings from the San Gabriels from 2011. Um, and uh, there's a type two and a type one right there in the same recording. Um, first time anybody had recorded them and to check to see what they were. 
Uh, it was actually John Garrett who figured out what these were. I, I gave him the recordings and he went and dug, dug through the literature and figured them out. Um, the figure was prepared by Matt Young at the Cornell Lab. Um, and there was supposed to be a figure here, but apparently I forgot to put it in, so we'll skip that. And uh, wrap things up by saying, yet again, please record them if you find them. Um, you can help us understand the distributions of the different flight call types. There might be more types that haven't been recognized yet. And there's a particularly strong need for recordings of types four in the, uh, um, in this, basically the, the Rockies, type five in Mexico and Southern Arizona. Um, any of them in, um, in central Canada uh, where there are very few records. And so with that, um, I'll stop. And uh, here are a couple of uh, pretty pictures of some, uh, some crossbills, a type seven from Whitehorse and a type one even in Grosbeak from Grassy Hollow. And so with that, I will stop the show and um, take any questions that there might be. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank Great, you, thank you, Lance. Um, <clears throat> and we do have some questions. Uh, Scott asks, uh, how do we know that the flight calls are learned? Were they raised in captivity to establish this? Yes, and also and also studied um, in the field extensively by a number of researchers. Um, uh, Craig Bankman and his students, he, he's a professor in Colorado, have studied this extensively for a number of flight call types. Um, but there have been laboratory experiments done as well. Um, um, I would, I would point out that, that you know, passerine learning songs and the fact that they aren't hardwired in their genetics is, I mean, there are a lot of other birds that do that. A, a lot of warblers do, for example, you know, pubic strands. I mean, you know, they end up having to sort of regional dialects that are associated with their neighbors. It's um, so I know it sounds weird and perhaps a bit un, unusual that these birds learn their songs, but that's not, they aren't the only species that does that. Great, thank you. Um, Ted asks, since Ponderosa pine is also a Western species, is it possible that type two crossbill might be multiple types since they're widely spread across the country, like type 10 and 12, I guess? Mm, that's the first suggestion of that that I've heard. That's, a, that's an interesting idea. Um, I'm not aware of any evidence for that, but uh, I'm not sure that anyone's really tried to dig that deeply into the, the type twos to try to check. Um, may, maybe if, I, so I haven't read Ken Irwin's work completely and it's, it's, it's voluminous or Groth's work, Jeff Groth's work, it's also voluminous. Um, they might address that in there, but I, I, I honestly do not know. Um, but yes, there certainly are a lot of variants for type twos. There are more type two variants than most of the other ones. Um, I played only a couple of examples that are some of the more common ones, um, but there actually are, are several others. Um, yeah, interesting thought, Ted. Wish I could give you a better answer. Great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Lily asks, could the range expansions and eruptions of, <clears throat> I guess the recent ones from like, you know, between now, um, you know, 2014, 2022, uh, is that due to climate change and other environmental issues or just more eBird observations? Um, probably more eBird observations and also quite likely some eruptions by the different types. Um, so one thing I forgot to mention is that multiple flight call types um, of both species can erupt simultaneously. Um, with red crossbills, it's it's not unusual to find two or three flight call types in the same eruption in the same geographic area in places where they don't normally occur. Um, with evening gross peaks, I'm not aware that this has been looked at as extensively, but here in Southern California, on multiple occasions, I, I've actually encountered both types one and two um, in the same place, the San Jacintos, the San Bernardinos, and the San Gabriels. I mean, this has happened like four or five times um, when I've stumbled into them. And in fact, in this part of the state, when I encounter evening gross beaks, I usually encounter both types of one and two. Um, elsewhere, farther north in the state, there have been times in like, for example, around Mammoth, where I've encountered um, just one of them, but not the other. Um, but crossbills, yeah, I mean, they, they, they definitely move around. I mean, there, a few years ago, Tim Sparr and I were recording crossbills in the mountains north of Flagstaff, and we found four different flight call types there. 
and mm-hmm. there aren't normally that many. And then, you know, a year later, we found five flight, flight call types in the Chiricahuas um, on the same day. Um, there was an eruption there at the time as well. Wow. Wow. So I, th- I think it's mostly just that more people are recording them and entering them into eBird, compounded by some eruptions since 2014 when I first started giving this talk. There have been multiple eruptions since then. So, they, you know, they, they've been people and people seek them out. I mean, they're cool and they don't occur in a lot of places where there are birders. So when they're around, people go, go looking for them. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, let's see. Do we have any more questions? I do not see any more. I didn't see anything in the chat. Oh, oh, I take it back. No, I, that's it. Oh, was there one in the chat? No, I don't see anything. Um, <clears throat> Kimball says, just to expand horizons, there seems to be a great deal of variation in flight calls of many other pasturing species, um, including horned larks and red-winged blackbirds. <laughs> Fertile ground for more recordings. Yeah, pine grosbeaks are also known to, to make different flight calls. It's, I don't know that it's been established that there are the different types the way there are, say, for evening grosbeaks. Um, but that's something else. If, yeah, again, if you're, if you're out and about and you encounter pine grosbeaks, um, and there are some in California, you know, they do nest in the Sierra Nevada, um, definitely record them. Or if you happen to be someplace farther north and east where they're more widespread, also record them there. And for those of you who might be spending some time in the northeast, say, over the holidays. As I mentioned, there's an eruption of evening grosbeaks happening right now, a pretty big one. There are also crossbills moving around over there and a modest eruption of, of pine grosbeaks is happening. Um, uh, and one thing I, I meant to put in the talk but forgot is that, um, so Matt Young from the Cornell Lab has established um, a coordinated effort to study um, finches and their vocalizations across the across the planet, really. And so he, uh, he set up, along with help from Tim Sparr and several others, the Finch Research Network. There's a website for it. Um, I don't happen to have it right in front of me, but uh, while we're talking here, if somebody could dig it out and maybe paste it into the chat, that'd be great. Just, just Google Finch Research Network. Um, one of the things that they do every year is they, they uh, post the Finch forecast for the eastern part of the country in terms of <laughs> what may or may not erupt, um, and uh, which is always an interesting thing to read if you have the the fort- good fortune to spend time in that part of the country during the winter. But they also have nice um, examples of the different sounds by finches all over the world now. And, um, and you know, it's kind of a summary of different uh, different aspects of research uh, into finches that's that's happening. Um, so Matt, Matt Young is the most passionate person about finches that I've ever met. He, he just sort of lives and breathes finches, um, crossbills and grosbeaks, but crossbills especially. He's extremely passionate about them. And so he's really taking the lead and is running with it. Is that the finchnetwork.org? Um, yes, it should be. That yeah, sounds that's what, So Ted has posted it on the chat. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, so again, you know what? You'll, you'll perhaps tire hearing me say this, but please record them whenever you find them. Um, I know people like to take pictures of them, and I do too. But when you see crossbills, please pull out your phone or whatever gadget you have and try to get a recording. Um, the phones are getting more and more capable. I mean, my iPhone 8, which is admittedly a bit old now, is more sensitive than my iPhone 5 was. <laughs> and, um, you know, they're not just improving the cameras on these phones, they're improving the audio equipment too. And they're, they're getting surprisingly sensitive um, and well, well worth a try. I mean, I've had some perfectly good recordings with my iPhone that enabled me to identify the flight call types that were on the, on the recordings. And it, it can be very easy and quick to do. So please give it a try. Sounds good. Anything in the chat? Oh, Ted posted and great. I don't see any other questions coming out. Well, Lance, thank you very much for a very, very interesting talk. I think everyone got a lot out of it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, maybe a bit overwhelming, but there's just a lot of interesting stuff happening with uh, with crossbills and grosbeaks right now. And uh, in, in, um, 
I did want to remind everyone that Lance did do a couple of wonderful webinars on recording for us, and they're up on our website. So you might want to check those out. Um, but then again, technology is changing, as Lance pointed out, and your smartphone might be good enough. Uh, please join us next week for Andy Birch and preposterous paleartic passerines. And that should be a, I'm bouncing out. That should be a very, very fun webinar. And anything else, Mark? I, I think that's it. So thank you very much, Lance. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, thank you, Lance. you Kimball. Very good. And we'll see everybody next week with Andy. Sounds good. See you all next week. Take care, everyone. All right. Good night. Good, good night. night.